to open doors to richness in our lives, we each may choose the best of what has gone before, the best of that which lives today, to fashion us a team. And from the minds of those who enter in, this gift is given us, ours still to give and yet to keep, a gift of value great with life itself. And this, our heritage. In this series of heritage programs, we are privileged to meet Dr. Paul J. Tillich, author, lecturer, theologian, philosopher, and member of the faculty, Harvard Divinity School, Harvard University. In this first program, Dr. Tillich and his guests discuss philosophy and religion. Dr. Tillich is joined by Dr. Robert C. Johnson, professor of systematic theology, and Mr. Walter E. Wiest, associate professor of philosophy of religion and Christian ethics, both of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Dr. Tillich, you left Germany in 1933 to come to this country. Uh, would you care to comment on why you came to the United States? Yes, <clears throat> I would like very much. It was even before Hitler came to power that I was opposed to the Nazi movement. I was at that time at the University of Frankfurt am Main as professor of philosophy, and uh, the Nazis had organized uh, Nazi student groups. And one day, they entered the University of Frankfurt and beat up all the liberal students. And I was in the midst of it. And then we had a trial and threw the students out of the university. And I was, of course, active in this trial. And uh, so I uh, produced the wrath of the Nazi movements against me. <coughs> and there were many other reasons, my whole political attitude. In any case, when Hitler came to power, I was a few weeks later dismissed for my position in the University of Frankfurt. And the same summer, a few months later, Reinhold Niebuhr came to Germany and asked me to come, after I had been dismissed, to Union Theological Seminary. And then I had a very dramatic talk with the uh, Secretary of Education of Prussia, who was my highest boss, in <coughs> which I told him my position very frankly about the persecution of the Jews and my affirmation of the Old Testament, Christianity generally. And then it was clear that I couldn't stay any longer in Germany, and so I decided to follow uh, Niebuhr's invitation. Uh, Dr. Tillich, in every man's case, I suppose, there's a, a close connection generally between uh, the things which have happened to him in his own uh, life and experience and the development of his thought. Uh, would you uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the, the other turning points in your uh, biography which have uh, been influential in the development of your thought? Yes, I can this, uh, tell you of one very dramatic moment. I was a chaplain in the First World War, and it was in the Battle of the Champagne in France. And it was one night in which many of my friends were fatally injured, in a terrible battle, and I had to talk to them, and they died all around me. And in this night, something happened to my thought. Up to this time, I was a good German idealist of the type of Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, 
And in this night, my idealistic philosophy broke down forever. And this was one of the most important moments in my development. Ever since, I would call my own theological thinking, my philosophical thinking, a kind of critical realism, but certainly not idealism anymore. I have seen <clears throat> the deepest negative side of life in this night, and my eyes were open forever to see this side also. Have there been any events that have taken place since you've been in this country that you feel have uh, had a particular bearing upon shifts in your thinking? Perhaps I could say that Corsi coming itself in the beginning yes. was another turning point. I still was bound by many elements of my past to the kind of thinking which was traditional in Germany, <coughs> which was much more theoretical, speculative, philosophical. I came to this country and I noticed that here the practical problems were much more in the foreground than the merely metaphysical problems. And this was a great experience, which of course was not easy to digest. It took me many years before it influenced me deeper, but it did. And so my theology, especially my preaching, is now much more directed to the realities of the daily life than it was in Germany. I know you have commented in the past on uh, the transition which you made from the German language to the English language. Uh, I wonder how much effect this has had basically upon your thinking and your writing. Were you not 48 years old before you started speaking? 47. 47. I learned English. Yes. Yes. And, I and yet it has been the major vehicle of your writing. Yes, of course. I decided in the moment in which I put my foot on this continent <clears throat> that now I never will write anything in German because translating things is a terrible job. It's much better to write a bad English lecture and then to have it English by students than to write it in German and then to have it translated. And this self-discipline, never writing again in German, was the basis for my limited ability to use the English language. But there was something else. The English language and the German language have a quite different type. The German language is full of nouns, and you can put half a dozen nouns together and make a new word out of it, which, of course, doesn't help to the clarity of your thinking. And so I wrote very difficult sentences in my later German writings, sometimes so difficult then when it came later on to translating them into English. I myself didn't understand them anymore. But the uh, English language is a language of words mostly, and this makes it for much more clarity and logical consistency than German. And uh, so I learned to think through the help of this new instrument, the English language. And when, after uh, the war, 48, I came back to Germany the first time and gave a lecture in German, all my former pupils and friends were very much surprised that they could easily understand me. There were even some German colleagues who said he has become much shallower than he was, but this meant now they could 
understand. And that means in German, uh, you are shallow. So the uh, English language did me awfully good, and I am eternally grateful that it forced me into a new kind of thinking. Yeah. You don't agree altogether then, Dr. Tillich, with the, uh, what seems to be so often the attitude of, of those who come from elsewhere uh, to America that uh, this uh, rather common sense character of much of our thinking and, and our attitudes is necessarily shallow. No, by no means. I think the greatest things in world history have been said in the simplest way, for instance, yeah. the gospel stories and things yeah. like that. And uh, my whole uh, desire was to reach more of this noble simplicity. Uh, there was another question that occurred to my mind as we were talking about uh, uh, your being impressed with uh, uh, the attempt in America to make religious faith relevant to uh, uh, contemporary life, let's say, in society. Uh, while you were in Germany, you were active, were you not, in the religious socialist movement? Yes. Uh, uh, which meant that uh, even there, before you came here, you were very much concerned about the social yes. implications yes. of religion. Uh, uh, could you say what was the difference between the social concern that you had before coming here and uh, the change in your thinking in this regard after you came here? No, I think the change was in the beginning not so very great because I came here from the very beginning into the Christian socialist movement under the direction of Reinhold Niebuhr, who also had called me from Germany to come to the Union Seminary. And we always worked together in this movement. The difference was that in Germany, as in most European countries, there is a large social democratic party. It's a political idea. In this country, there was only a ne negligible uh, movement of this type, and it has in the meantime completely disappeared. Uh, this was one difference. And another difference was that in Germany, our movement called itself religious socialist, which meant that we included also Jews and all kinds of non-Christians. While in this country, it was called Christian socialism. And it was even a kind of Christian brotherhood here, uh, which was something quite new, which I never had in Germany in this way. And uh, the reason was, of uh, the consequence was that uh, the <coughs> membership of this movement was consisted mostly of Christians and very few non-Christians. Dr. Tillich, uh, I wonder if you would care to comment on uh, the particular uh, thinkers in the history of thought who have had the most uh, the deepest influence upon your thinking through the years? Now, this is a very large task, you ask me. Uh, I uh, could perhaps say that very early I read and learned by heart a philo history of philosophy. And from the very beginning, the earliest Greek thinkers before Socrates, people like Heraclitus and Parmenides, influenced me fundamentally. And this influence never has ceased. For me, still, a man like Parmenides is more important than most modern philosophers. But then the influence came from German classical philosophy. I studied Kant and Fichte even before I came to the university because I loved it. And uh, there I was introduced in what I called before uh, the German 
classical idealist philosophy. And finally, it led me to a man named Schelling, who was a predecessor of Hegel in the development, and who had, of all of them, the greatest influence on me. Uh, <clears throat> in modern times, I would say that Nietzsche was decisive for my later development, and then in the 20th century, Heidegger. Well, these are a few names. I could go on like this indefinitely. Have you, um, you mentioned Schelling and you mentioned Heidegger. Uh, do you consider yourself to be closely related to the movement that today is called existentialism? Yes, that's uh, certainly the case. Has Kierkegaard had a basic influence upon your thinking? Yes. Uh, Kierkegaard, we discovered as students around 1904 and 5 and read him when his name was completely unknown in larger uh, groups and I don't think known at all in this country. In any case, at that time his influence started. But uh, he was not decisive. Decisive for me was uh, the development of Schelling, which I would call in philosophical jargon, in development from essentialism, which is very similar to what I called idealism before, to existentialism in the latest period of his life. And I am still often surprised to what a degree this man has anticipated most of the concepts of present-day existentialism as it is developed by Heidegger and uh, Sartre and Marcel and Jaspers and many others. So I was introduced in a period in which the word existentialism didn't yet exist into existentialist thinking by the later period of Schelling. But I have in the meantime discovered something else which I must tell you. When I am asked which was your first and greatest influence in terms of uh, existentialism, I would say my reading and learning by heart of Hamlet, of Shakespeare's Hamlet, where you have quite a lot of existentialist formulations about the human predicament. And as a young man, I was perhaps 17 years old at that time, I took them into myself as nothing else at that time. And so I was well prepared when Schelling came. Would you be able to give us a, a definition of existentialism, Dr. Tillich? Oh, I would say it is that philosophy which doesn't deal so much with the general nature of man and of his world, but which deals much more with the uh, human predicament, with the way in which man is born and has to die, in which he is in anxiety, in which he uh, is in the feeling of guilt, and often in our time, this deep feeling of emptiness, of meaninglessness of life, all this belongs to the description of uh, the human predicament as the existentialists give it. And not even most important, the philosophical existentialists, but I would say even more important, the novelists and the playwrights and the poets and the modern artists, the painters and sculptures and so on. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> how, how far would you say that uh, the existentialism that we uh, see in these various forms today in our society uh, have Christian roots or background? I think that everything which happened since the Western world has been brought into the Christian camp 
that everything has consciously or unconsciously Christian influence. And uh, this doesn't depend whether they call themselves Christian or anti-Christian. A man like Nietzsche, for instance, calls himself anti-Christian. But he is the son of a Christian minister. He was the son of a Christian minister. And in one moment he acknowledges this. He says about the uh, preachers and priests whom he attacks all the time in the most aggressive way. They have blood of my own blood. He knew that uh, in him there was the Christian blood, although it turned, it turned against Christianity. Yeah. Would you say the same thing is true of uh, Sartre? I think Sartre is farther away from Christianity than Nietzsche is, because he has a long tradition of French humanism. Uh, and French humanism is the attempt for centuries of developing a doctrine of men in which as many Christian elements as possible are excluded. So I would say even this is still Christian humanism, but it is much freer from uh, visible influences of Christianity than in Nietzsche. I take it you would not agree, Dr. Tillich, with those who take the position that uh uh, some form of existentialist thinking uh, might uh, somehow become Christian or be related to uh, Christianity, whereas uh, what you have called the idealist or essentialist tradition uh, somehow is hostile to uh, Christianity. I would say every tradition can be used, but I would say that in our period of history it was a tremendous luck that existentialism came into reality because the existentialist description of the human predicament, finitude, having to die, disease, guilt, despair, all these concepts are also in the description of man without God in the Christian tradition. So I would say uh, we should use existentialist knowledge in order to describe the human situation without God. Do you think Christianity is at a, at a disadvantage, uh, Dr. Tillich, when it uh, aligns itself with uh, a past philosophy so that this sort of thing is not possible? I don't know when I fully understood your question. You're saying that uh, existentialism is quite valuable to the interpretation of, of uh, Christianity today. Yes, very much. Now, many so. theologians uh, tend to align themselves with past theological traditions and think only in terms of the Platonic tradition or some other past tradition. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind that. I don't think that Christianity is bound to any special tradition. It can use all of them and it must transform all of them. It cannot identify uh, itself with any of them. In your early writings, uh, you referred to yourself as a boundary thinker. And uh, I remember reading one early autobiographical piece uh, where you said a great deal about this and felt that somehow the word boundary described the type of thinking that you represented. I wonder if uh, you could explain what you meant by this and whether you still feel this way. Now, uh, this is uh, partly very autobiographical. It says that uh, in my whole uh, development, I was sometimes a professor of philosophy, sometimes a professor of theology, and uh, even sometimes a professor of social education. Now, this means I do not belong to one of these realms unambiguously. And when I, for instance, came to Frankfurt am Main, where I was professor of philosophy, I became more theological. When I came to Union Theological Seminary, where I was a theologian, then I became more philosophical in order to keep these two sides always together and not uh, be uh, in 
one line alone. I really believe that today the main problem is how can we relate philosophy, which I consider to be the universal consideration of world and man, with theology, which is the explanation of the Christian message as such. And uh, so the boundary line is the boundary line between a universal understanding of the human situation and the special Christian message. Are there other ways, Dr. Tillich, in which you would describe yourself as a boundary theologian or a boundary type thinker? I would say it boundary type man, not only theologian, not only thinker. For instance, in a autobiographical sketch, which uh, will be printed in paperback very soon, there I speak of the boundary line of land and ocean. I prefer to stay at the boundary line of land and ocean. And my old age home is therefore in a resort place, East Hampton, or the boundary line between country and city. I am very much fascinated by the city, cannot live without it, but after a certain time I must be in the country, or the boundary line between the scientific and the poetic. I try to uh, make each of my sermons not only into a speech about the subject, but about a kind of rhythmic expression of life in a more poetic sense, or the boundary line <coughs> between theology and philosophy, which we already have discussed, or the boundary line between religion and culture generally, or if you want the other formula, between church and world. All these boundary lines are the place where I feel at home. Uh, and therefore, perhaps I was able to stand my emigration and to go from Europe to America and then sometimes back to Europe and back to America, being even in this respect on the boundary line. And I believe that the favored place for understanding is a boundary line. But of course you have to pay the price. The favored place for living is in the middle of the country. But there I never could stay for a long time. We have been visiting with Dr. Paul J. Tillich, distinguished philosopher and theologian and member of the faculty Harvard Divinity School, Harvard University, and his guests, Dr. Robert C. Johnson and Mr. Walter E. Wiest. In part two of this series, Dr. Tillich and his guests discuss philosophy of life. This program was produced in the studios of station WQED in Pittsburgh. And from the minds of those who enter in, this gift is given. And this, our heritage. This is National Educational Television.